communities, um, the I will respectfully request that we all rise to our feet as we take the national anthem, the State of Osho anthem, and the Adeleke University anthem. After that, we would be having. To serve our fatherland with love and strength and faith, the labor of our heroes past shall never be in vain. Vice Chancellor, sir, distinguished guests, we have all come here to begin the celebrations of the ninth undergraduate and fifth postgraduate convocation of Adeliki University. And you are all privileged to witness to witness this great and august celebration. To that effect, I want us to jam our hands together as we celebrate ourselves and celebrate God Almighty for giving us the privilege to witness the convocation ceremony for this year. Today we begin with the pre-convocation lecture. And that is why we are gathered here. Before we go on, I would like to recognize uh, a few of the personalities and dignitaries here present. Of course, we recognize in absentia the pro-chancellor and chairman of council, Dr. Adedeji Abeliki. Please let's turn our hands together. We have also present here today the President and Vice-Chancellor of our great institution, Professor Solomon Ajayi Adibala. Sir, you are welcome. We also recognize the presence of the Senior Vice-President and the Deputy Vice-Chancellor in person of Professor Luke Onoha, Professor. You are most welcome. The University Registrar is here present with us. He is in the person of Elder Kenneth O'Reilly. Sir, you are most welcome. The University Bursa, I believe, will be joining us soon enough. We have also present here this morning the University Librarian in person of Professor Uyoma Onyoma. Prof, you are most welcome this morning. And we have the university pastor who just gave us the opening prayer. Pastor Dr. Onyoma Ngai Futari. Pastor, you are most welcome. 
I can see also present in the auditorium this morning the Executive Director of Internal Audit in the person of Dr. Bright Mamadi. You're welcome, sir. We have deans and directors also present. As we go on, we will recognize their presence. But I would also at this point like to recognize the presence of the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Oshu State University, in person of Professor Anthony Kola Olifaya. Sir? The Deputy Vice Chancellor Academics. You are welcome, sir. So, as I stated earlier, as we go on in the program, we will take more recognitions. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite to the podium the President and Vice Chancellor of Angelica University to give his welcome address. Yes, again, Professor Solomon. A round of applause as Prof comes forward. Good morning. There's no formal address. Now, we are just the news to a best lecture. We are doing all the time. We are doing in his book for the next 10 hours to us. So I will wait and give the time to him. I want to welcome you all for this very August edition. It's a once in a while event. We want so much, not just to the students who are living, but to everybody, those who are still here. When we chose our August lecture, it was a very, very vital point of our event. It's best unity. Now, if it's held, we are supporting. The University of Manchester to University, the marvelous achievements he actually recorded over there five years to now, remember? And of course, we are asking you not to replace the middle school at the University of Alabama. It's not a while coming very much, my brother. Because one of the people I am who are not coming, it's not me to us here. Every time we are pleased to be here, he was always here. And of course, he was a beautiful wife and an elegant lady. From our being a part, we are very supportive, not just to the husband, but in school. While we are there as day, of course, I turned the husband and I gave a good wife, and he was so happy. Enjoy with him. He had a good wife who was not just a wife, but a partner indeed. I want to thank you so much, madam, for coming and allowing your guy to come. And that's very important. When I saw the topic, I was just wondering. God will give me a free hand. I said, choose what you want. But we impose on you any topic. And I saw universities striving for utopia. The change maker must change. It speaks volumes. Volumes. First and foremost, universities striving for utopia. What is utopia? The ideal. The best ever. The peak you can ever reach. Utopia. Now, universities are striving. They haven't got there yet, but they're hoping to get there and they're struggling one way or the other. I was in the UC on Monday this week and I spoke to the new um, acting uh, ES, Mr. Mayaki, the governors for now at this point. And universities are making changes every now and then. A very big one, you understand, is the current CCMAS. We are allowing universities to inject on their own. 30% of the curriculum based on your local need. And that's a new thing, it's innovation that means a lot because what we are saying is to strive to utopia means not a global utopia for now, the local one. What you might need in that day may not be the same thing that in Sokoto. Of course not. Though we're not training graduate for a day only, it's a global scale. But we're saying for now at this stage, what are we training the students for at our level, at the global level? Not just on the earth, but we are saying here, even for the heaven. 
that trading doesn't stop on Earth. If it stops on Earth, it's of use, no use. It means while you are gone, you are gone. Whereas for those who believe in the high heavens, after this life, there's a life to come. And our training here, I do know, contains that aspect of training. And we're saying the change maker must change. And I was asking myself, who is this change maker? I wanted to call him. I said, I'll wait until when he comes, he will let me know. Who is that change maker? But I want to think the change maker is talking about is the students, is the graduates, is you and I. To get to the utopia, we must change. I mean, our ways, or change our approach, or change our focus, or change our vision, change your personality. So that at the end, where you're being trained from here, I always mention this, that students who are here will always say two things. Number one, and directors here present. We have present here today, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, who also doubles as the director for the uh, convex uh, unit. He is Professor Adegbite Tobalashe. Prof, you are welcome, sir. We also have the Dean, Faculty of Business and Social Sciences, Professor Ibidako Oketunji. Prof, you're most welcome. We also have here present the Dean, Faculty of Basic Medical Science, Professor Oye Ride. Sir, you are welcome. Sir. And then we have the Dean, Student Care Services, Professor Martina Ogutoibo Atere. Prof, you're most welcome. We have also the Director, Academic Planning, Professor Temitokwe Oyedepo. You are most welcome, Prof. We have the Director, Quality Assurance, Dr. Modukweola Adeniro. You are most welcome. The Director, Center for Remedial and Continuing Education is also present here this morning. He's in the person of Professor Olatunji Alao. Prof, you're most welcome. We have the director of the Office of Research, Linkages, and Grants, Dr. Titilayo Ajayoba. Prof, a doc, you are most welcome. Soon to be prof. And of course, we have the director of the SciWest unit, in person of Dr. Samuel Babaridi. Sir, you are welcome. And of course, we have uh, the director of the ICT unit, also present in the auditorium. He is Mr. Shekoni Ayofe. Sir, you are most welcome. We have so many heads of departments also present. As we go on, if time permits, we will indeed take more recognitions. At this time, we are gradually moving to the reason why we are gathered here this morning. And so I would like to invite upstage for the citation of the guest speaker this morning, the Dean Faculty of Arts and also the Director of the Conv Convex Unit, Professor Adegbite Tobalashe, to come and take the citation of the guest speaker. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I would like to stand on the already established protocol. Luckily, I don't have so much weight, so it won't break. My task this morning is very simple. Uh, a few years ago, I was at an event at Oshun State University. And at that event, I had a new phrase. And that new phrase is Koshele. <laughs> you know when you see things that have not happened before? Anything can happen. Especially when you have the microphone. There is nothing you cannot do. Yes. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you very much, Professor Labo de Popola. Like I said, my task is simple. I'm to read the bow sketch of Professor Labo de Popola. Labo de Popola is a professor of forest economics and sustainable development at the University of Ibadan, who, and he holds a 1990 PhD in forest economics, also from University of Ibadan. He commenced his academic career as a graduate assistant. He was appointed lecturer too. A position he occupied until 1994 when he was promoted to the grade of lecturer one. You see, he took his time in rising. In 1997, he became a senior lecturer and his academic career was finally capped with a professorship in forest economics on the 1st of October, 2002, which was 10 years after his first academic appointment. His wide-ranging academic experience includes appointments as undergraduate coordinator, postgraduate coordinator, sub-dean, undergraduate, sub-dean, postgraduate, faculty of Greek and forestry, and later sub-dean, postgraduate school. He has served as head of the Department of Forest Resources Management from 2005 to 2006, Dean Postgraduate School 2006 to 2010, and the Pioneer Director, Center for Sustainable Development, University of Ibadan, 2010 to 2015. He voluntarily relinquished the position on 31st December 2015, seven months before the end of his tenure. He served the university on several committees and boards, including Chairman, Council Campus Tree Management Committee, Chairman and Convener of the Committee on the First University of Ibadan Research Policy and the Creation of Research Management Office. He also chaired the committee that prepared the First University of Ibadan Policy on International Visitors. He has held appointments as visiting professor in several universities, including the University of Calabar, Olabisi Onobanjo University, Kano University of Science and Technology, University of Ilori, and Czech Antadiop University in Dakar, Senegal, among several others. He has also been external examiner in over 20 institutions within and outside the country, Nigeria. He's an experienced researcher and a project leader. He has led several internationally funded researches involving over 4 million US dollars, including the Mark Arthur Foundation 900,000 US dollar grants for the establishment of the Masters in Development Practices, MDP. The University of Ibadan was one of the 10 universities that won the grants involving over 70 universities across the globe. Grant for Education for Sustainable Development in Africa. It belongs to several professional associations and networks. And some of these associations are the Forestry Association of Nigeria, Commonwealth Forestry Association, African Forestry Research Network, African Forest Forum, African Network for Agroforestry Education, Association of Research Managers and Administrators UK, West African Research and Innovation Management Association, UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, among several others too numerous to mention. He has held several responsible positions in these associations and networks. He was elected the Business Manager of Forestry Association of Nigeria in the year 1997. National Secretary in 2001, and the National President of the same association in 2013, and he served in February of 2018. He served as member, editorial board, Nigerian Journal of Forestry, Assistant Editor, Business, Journal of Tropical Forest Resources from 1995 to 2003, National Contact Point, African Forest Research Network, AFORNET, 2001 to 2007. He was managing editor, Journal of the Tropical Forest Resources, from 2003 to 2008. 
He was editor-in-chief, Journal of Tropical Forest Resources member, FAO Expert Committee on Economics of Sustainable Forest Management in the Tropics, 2004. He was vice chairman, National Agroforestry Training and Education Group, 2005. He is currently the director, United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Nigeria. He is member, Leadership Council of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, chairman, Sustainable Support Forum, and several other positions he has held here. Uh, he is also a member of the technical support team of the forum, member of the National Peer Review Committee, he is also a member of the Nigerian Post-Secondary Education Data Systems, NIPEX, task team on the Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board, Federal Ministry of Education, a member of the editorial board of several publications. He founded the African Journal of Sustainable Development and was the chairman editorial board till 2019. In 2005, he was elected into the elite cadre of the Forestry Association of Nigeria as a fellow. He has won several, several awards and honors. They include award for invaluable service in agroforestry from the International Center for Research in Agroforestry, Nairobi, Kenya, 2001. Award for excellent service to the forestry profession by the Council of the Forestry Association of Nigeria. He also received the Oshun State Government Merit Award for Excellence in Science, Research, and Community Development in 2010, and an Award of Excellence by Oshun State Government in 2018 for making Oshun State Univers uh, University financially self-sustaining. Professor Labo de Popola has successfully supervised 20 PhD thesis while three others are ongoing. 16, I repeat, 16 of his PhD mentees are already professors within and outside Nigeria. He has also supervised one MPhil, 55 MSc dissertations, as well as 40 BSc students projects. He has edited and co-edited over 20 publications. His research activities have generated over 170 publications, including a patent, over 70% of which were published after his promotion to the rank of professor in 2002. Also, a 19 chapter book on reading in tropical sustainable forest management has been published in his honor by his PhD mentees. He is a specialist in resource economics and sustainable development. His main areas of competencies include natural resource economics and management, sustainable development, capacity building, institutional and program management, networking, institutional linkages and positioning, research extension, communication and organization, biodiversification of landscapes and administration. He has served as consultant to FAO, AFDB, the World Bank, DFID, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, ICRAF, IBRD, AFONET, NCF, African Forest Forum, and several other national and international organizations. In counseling, teamwork, mentoring, and coaching. And all of these are very evident in the number of students that he has trained. He served as a member of the governing council of the University of Ibadan between 2011 and 20, 2015. He also served as a member of the Project Implementation Committee of University of Elisha and a member of the Pioneer Governing Council of the University. He is currently the Chairman, Project Implementation Committee of the proposed Abdurazak Abubakar Tony University, Ganmo, in Kwara State. He received a Lifetime Award for Excellence and Service by his alma mater, the University of Ibadan 
in November of 2018. He served as the Vice Chancellor of Osho State University, Oshogbo, from the 5th of November 2016 to the 4th of November 2021. In the 60 months that he was in the saddle as the Vice Chancellor, he successfully and efficiently managed the university, ensuring regular payment of salaries on or before the 25th of every month. Staff and student discipline was also enhanced. Capacity building was enhanced. Infrastructure transformation and the international visibility of Osho State University also was done while he was there. While serving as vice chancellor, he still taught and supervised at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels at the University of Ibadan. He returned to the University of Ibadan on the 5th of November 2021, just a day after concluding his tenure as the Vice Chancellor of Osho State University. He holds the chieftaincy title of Ashiwaju, that is the pathfinder of Initial Land, which is his hometown. Labo Popola was born on the 28th of September 1960, and he is happily married to our own dear Professor Sherifa Tolubumi Labo Popola, and is blessed with children and grandchildren. With a standing ovation, please join me welcome the pre-convocation speaker for today, Professor Labode Popola Mayogasa. Please can we be seated? Thank you so very much. I want to appreciate Ad <coughs> Adibite for the rumors. Uh, yeah, I call all of these rumors, everything he read. I recognize the chairman of the governing council of this beautiful university. You know, when I get to any environment and I see trees, It's, it means it means there is life here, yeah. Because imagine a planet without a forest; all of us will be gone, because there will be no oxygen to breathe, and all the carbon will have to breathe in, and we'll all be dead in seconds. So I appreciate this beautiful university, and I appreciate the chairman of the governing council and all members of the governing council, the vice chancellor, my. Brother, an alumnus of that university, that university. I'm sure they know it, and they know it, okay. I want to appreciate the management of this university for the excellent job you're doing. And I'm going to talk about some of these things as we move on. The students for whom we are here, because without them, we have no business being here. I want to believe that some of them are here, but if they are not here, please accept my you all. I want to plead that you allow me to dedicate this speech to my first academic son who was slain Last month, June 5, my intellectual soulmate, Isaac Opeyemi Ajewole, may he so rest in peace. I'm sure you read about the sad story. I'm still struggling with the reality. The vice chancellor already delivered my lecture to that person. And I will also say that I know of a few other cases this is the kind of story that inspires hope. And having metamorphosed from an NGO, as it were, a not-for-profit organization helping people who are in need of help to become a university, also tells us that so many good things are possible. And it's part of the things we're going to talk about. Like I said, your vice chancellor, your president, has delivered the lecture somewhat. 
Now, every university has a mission. Every university has a vision. And we also have anthems. But if you look at the vision and mission statements of all the universities across the globe, we are talking about the same thing. We want to be what? We want to be excellent. We want to impact life. We want to be known internationally. We want to change life. We are all seeing the same thing. So I looked at your vision and mission statement and also your anthem. Very beautiful. It talks about the things that we need to be able to get to Utopia, if it is ever possible. I also am fascinated by what you regard as your values. Things like collective responsibility, accountability, honesty, openness, and integrity, tolerance, humility, unity in diversity, godliness, and joyful service, intellectual freedom, and responsibility, value-based education. If we can do 60, 70% of this, Ethiopia is very close. We may not get there, but we'll get close to it. So these values resonate with most universities. Every university you go to in the world, I'm sure you'll find things like this. So I'm very glad to be here. I'm an itinerant husband and father. I hardly stay at home. And uh, apologies, madam. Yeah, but thanks for holding the fourth. So I was in Faraway, New York, in the month of May this year, when the woman that I call my boss at home, your professor, informed me that her own boss, Professor Solomon Adebola, her own, the boss of my boss. So the boss of my boss, you know what that means? Aha, uh -huh. so when the boss of your boss wants you to do something, you don't have a choice. He wanted me to deliver what you call here pre-convocation lecture. The one I know is convocation lecture. You know I'm from a conservative university, and uh, that's the one I know. So I had another word, pre-convocation lecture. So I asked her, if she had not committed me to that assignment. Because she knows, she knows how itinerant I can be. But her response was that the president and your vice chancellor was serious about it. So I therefore wanted to know what theme the vice chancellor wanted me to focus on. And I was told to determine that. This, of course, was followed by a letter dated 31st of May 2023, formally inviting me and stating in black and white, you may wish to choose a topic that you believe will be appropriate for the occasion. So your vice chancellor pushed all the liabilities and the credits of this speech to me. So I accepted it. For me, therefore, the occasion is not just about this convocation, and certainly not about Adelike University, but about the very essence of the academia and tertiary education governance. For all intents and purposes, tertiary education, the academia, supposed to be borderless, taking on the responsibility to interrogate our very essence and relevance as universities in a changing world, because the world is changing. OK, now we talk about chat GPT. Some five years ago, there was nothing like that. We're talking about artificial intelligence. Now, if you want to deliver a lecture, just put the topic in charge. DPT. It will give you the lecture. 
Your students now, I doubt if they will be working hard any longer. They can just put a topic in chat GPT and it will bring them the project. So we are in a changing world. How relevant are we? How useful are we to ourselves, to our institutions, to our environment, to the society, and to our creator who created us for a purpose? So I want to say that at events like this, I always give a caveat, and that's the fact that some of my positions and propositions may not be tasty to some birds. But then, that is the beauty of this business of academia. We do not have to agree on issues, but superior arguments must always prevail. It is just from my lecture and told you what utopia means. Utopia is a term used to describe an imagined, an ideal society or community considered to be perfect or near perfect. The idea of utopia has been explored in various works of literature, philosophy, and political theory. One of the most famous examples is the book Utopia by Sir Thomas More, written in 1516. I was an undergraduate then. In that book, Samoa describes an imaginary island society with a perfect societal, legal, and political system. That is practically impossible, even in the best of environments. The name utopia itself comes from the Greek word "u," meaning not and topos, meaning place. Such a perfect society cannot exist in reality, but we can walk towards it. You see, there is uh, the motto of the Anglican Youth Society. Um, you know, I'm not a Christian, but I resonate with many of these things. Striving for perfection. We can always strive. We can always imagine and work towards creating a better world. Many movements and social experiments throughout history have been influenced by the idea of utopia, and that's the challenge of this lecture. And it remains a popular subject for discussion as a kid. Some may not know what I'm talking about. I was in the primary school then. So Nigeria has never been senior lecturers. That's why we're registrars. That's why we're working in the Bull Street to make life better than it was before. But when we keep on emphasizing that, oh, Godari is like cursing ourselves. I'm not a pastor. I'm not an imam. But I have an idea of what God wants us to do in this life. So there have been songs and poems and poems and writings after writings over the years that see nothing good in our country. Worse still is the unending vitriolic criticism from our ivory towers. That's the core of universities striving towards Ethiopia. We want perfection. We want things to be good. Just belong to any social media group where you have professors. It's all about criticism. Nothing good about our country. Nothing good about our university system. But that cannot be correct. So I want to challenge us that as academics, we have to think twice. I'm going to talk more about some of these issues. So who is a change maker? A change maker is someone who spots opportunity that will contribute to the greater good. Please mark that, the greater good. Not good for yourself, good for your society, good for your neighbor, 
good for your institution, not just about yourself. He or she or they, because they can be more than one, creatively set about innovating to fulfill that opportunity. In other words, when you spot an opportunity, you have to work towards that opportunity. It's not just enough. So there is money somewhere. Then you start dreaming about it. You have to work towards earning, not stealing, earning that money. The change maker inspires and influences others to join and support them in their change making journey, persisting until the positive difference is achieved. The term change maker was popularized by President Bill Clinton, who often described his wife, Hillary Clinton, as a change maker. Now, what is the essence of education? The essence of education, particularly at the university level, is lucidly captured in the vision and mission statement, as well as the core values espoused by Adeleke University, and indeed those of over 200 others in the nooks and crannies of this country. The nature and essence of a university is to teach, diffuse, and extend universal knowledge. Knowledge that is discoverable, knowledge that is applicable to humanity everywhere and at all times. I said earlier on, the academia is supposed to be borderless. So the knowledge is also supposed to be borderless anywhere. The knowledge you teach or you give or you extend must be borderless, must be applicable everywhere. System then we can perceive. I talked about AI, artificial intelligence. Most of the people that are working on it are not in the university system. Most of the people that are working on life-changing technologies are not necessarily in the university system. So there is a view that we should have universities, whatever that means. In other words, there is more than one way of knowing more than one way of transferring knowledge. I want to believe that this document, document will be printed so that you can have the details of what I'm talking about. So these controversies will linger on and there's nothing we can do about it. And if we look at Agenda 2030, the United Nations and its sustainable development goals tend to expose the world as being flat. If you look at the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, for those who know about it, it talks about everything we need to get to utopia. It talks about everything that will give us food, everything that will give us good health, everything that will make us rich, everything that will make us have a good climate, everything that will give us peace, everything that will give us good governance. So no country in the world can claim to be able to attain all this. It's like perfection. So the Sustainable Development Goals has exposed the world as being flat, and flat, quote and unquote, that what is happening here, so it's the same thing everywhere. Even the US, they are having their challenges. UK, where your people jack back to. They are having their challenges. Those who have been there will tell you how things are. So the challenges are everywhere. And what we should be talking about is how we can resolve these challenges. Now we will look at the history of Nigerian universities because the emphasis is how we have to strive towards Ethiopia and how we can also make the changes that will take us there. If we look at history, Nigeria University started from the colonial system. UI, Makarere University, University of Legon, all of them, the three main universities in 1948. Thereafter, we started having other universities, University of Lagos, ABU, UNN, that were supposed to serve the three major regions that we had in Nigeria then. But later, we started having more and more those we call the second generation universities. And as we speak today, we already have 
over 200 universities in Nigeria, including this beautiful and um, fledgling universities. Sorry, university, Adelike University. So the table I have here shows that we have 219 universities. But after that table, I understand that over 30 have been approved. So we have so many universities, and the trend has continued to change almost on a daily basis. We continue having them. And the question is, why are we having them? Some people are already arguing against it, particularly those of us who are in the public universities. I used to argue against it. But I'm seeing more and more reasons why we should have more private universities. People need to have their choices. People need to have their freedom as to where to receive their education. And I don't believe that any university is superior to the other. This classification of uh, state university, federal university, and uh, private university. A private university can be better than a federal university. We've seen it in this country. So the question is, what are the universities doing? It's not about whether they are public, private, or state, or whatever you want to, uh, how you want to classify it. So the roles of a university and its constituents. We have several roles. The supervisory agencies are there. The vice chancellor just said he went to NUC. That's one of his supervisors. We have uh, issues of governance in the university system. We all know the structure of governance in the university system. Um, you must have a governing council, you must have management. The management has to be led by a vice chancellor. I don't want to go into all these details. We also have university stakeholders. The government is a stakeholder. It has to play its own role. We have, we have university staff. They have to play their own role. We all know what the roles are. We have university students. They have to play their own roles. University Alumni Association. I don't want to go into all these details, but you can find it in the text. Alumni Association, very, very powerful. Some of them have made difference in the lives of universities. A university like Harvard, what it gets from its alums, more than enough to do so many things. Even close by, University of Ibadan, last year, an alumnus of that college of medicine facilitated the donation of $1 million to the university. So these are stakeholders that can bring the desired change that we all want. Parents. Parents, it's not about just paying school fees. It's not just about taking care of the children. It's about showing interest in what the university is doing. Professional bodies and organizations, they are stakeholders. They have to shape how universities are run. The general public, people in Ede, people in Oshun, people in and around the university environment, all of these are stakeholders. So what I'm saying in essence is that everybody that has something to do with the university system, whether you are a regulator, whether you are in the governing council, whether you are in management, whether you are a student, whether you are a member of staff, we are all change makers. So I'm using that word change maker to qualify everybody that has something to do with the university system. So let's interrogate the performance of the university system in Nigeria. If we take a cursory look at the scenario in Nigeria, it depicts a coat of many colors. The Nigerian university system used to be noted for its rigor and integrity. It is presently experiencing some tumble down the hill slope. We all know this. And some of the issues are very simple. And you keep on wondering why should they happen? I, at times I ask myself, why should a university close for 10 months, even if you are not being paid salaries? 
if you're a serious scholar, you will not feel comfortable being at home for 10 months, eight months. And we are celebrating it. Uh, thank God for private universities. One of the reasons that I'm supporting private universities now, because I don't imagine, this. can they? Eh? They cannot. And that's what actually saved Ocean State University. There's a law in this country that says, if you don't work, you don't get paid. So we invoked that law. It was an unpopular decision, but it didn't matter. What's important is that it achieved its aim. That's why you still have a university called Ocean State University. Otherwise, that university would have been gone because of those tendencies to disrupt the tendencies to destroy. So we now have a stable university in that place. So good enough, uh, the judiciary has all made a pronouncement on this, that there is a law about no work, no pay. So I get it's put paid to that. I don't see that happening again in the Nigerian university system. So unfortunately, we have had that over the years, and it is not helping the progress of our university system. The university system, the way we have it today, has become an all-commerce affair where intellectualism does not seem to thrive. Gradually, our universities are becoming more famous for the number of closures than the number of inventions and solutions initiatives that we prefer. Now, if we look at the contemporary university system in Nigeria, and even the research system, not just about the university system. There is the culture of the academia, which we know is no longer thriving. And what is this culture about? Critical thinking. If you want to be a change maker, you must be able to think critically. We don't have many people in the university system thinking critically any longer. If you are in some meetings, you'll ask yourself, am I really sitting in a university meeting? Critical thinking, we are losing it. Neutrality is an academic culture. For any subject, a good academic must try to be neutral until you hear the whole story before you make your comment. But you see, you can see all of this in any social media group that you belong to. Just let someone post something. Everybody starts talking about it. Everybody starts condemning it. Everybody starts criticizing. The first thing that an academic should do is to try to be neutral in every situation. Another character that we look for in academics, evidence-based conclusion. Should an academic just conclude? If you want to run to any conclusion, there must be evidence, evidence-based conclusion. It's an academic culture we are losing. Are we inquisitive as academics? Many of us are no longer inquisitive. Are communication skills becoming questionable? There are professors who will tell you, go and on the light. Uh, go and off the light. There are professors who will say that. Hmm? I did indeed. Yes, we hear it on radio. We hear it in our communication. It is part of our academic culture. You see, I'm a forester, very proud to be. Okay, so communication skills, it's important. We are losing it. You can't be a change maker if you cannot communicate very well. An academic need to be deep. Deep. This must be deep in everything. Whether it's directly about you, about the society. So when you are deep, it means you become prehensive in the way you look at issues. An academic must be frugal. It's part of the academic culture. If you are not frugal, you know, um, there is a word in Yoruba, apa. Apa. Eruaje. Unino kuno. An academic must be frugal. 
Unfortunately, we are losing all of that. I'm going to talk about that. You see, in the public university system, I don't know how much it costs to build this hall. If it costs you 20 million to put together this hall, in a public university, it can cost 50 million. Not a good quality outfit. It may not even be as good as this. That's what we have. So we are losing the culture of frugality. An academic must have pride. By talking about pride, I'm not saying you should be proud. But yes, what is wrong with being proud? I mean, once you're sure-footed, being proud is different from being arrogant. Okay? So there must be pride. We're losing it. You see, if you have pride, you will not be toasting your student to... And it happens. It happens. If you have pride, you will not be asking your students to buy you spare tire that you came to, you couldn't make the lecture in good time uh, because you had a problem with your tire. You don't have pride. If you have pride, you won't do that as an academic. An academic must be elegant. Your appearance. You must be neat. You see, you can wear your T-shirt and your jeans. If not for today, what will I be doing in this? I have no business putting on ties. But you must be elegant. If you wear slippers, sneakers, just a shirt, you must be elegant. But you know, if you put on the best of dresses and you put on a chain, or what do you call it? Eh? How can you call yourself an academic? So you need to be elegant, but elegant does not mean dressing over kill. An academic must have virtue. Virtue. You know what it means? This is a faith-based university. The do's and the don'ts, the simple things of life that we should be known for. An academic must be well informed you see, if you don't read, you can't be well informed. It means you must read and read and read and read. You cannot be a change maker if you don't read, if you are not well informed. Collaboration, I'm going to talk more about that. In academics, you cannot work alone. And that's why most of the times we talk about we. You see, I can write a paper and when I'm presenting it, I'll be using the pronoun we, not I. You see, a good academic will not arrogate things to himself. Even if you're a vice chancellor and you go on radio, you go on television and you create an impression that you are the one that did everything, is that possible? You have management, you have subdeans, you have deans who are working with you. So we, ownership, an academic must strive to be is part of our culture. An academic must be humble. Humility is our culture. And that's why a good academic will tell you, I'm still a student. Scholarship is about being a student. Being a student for life because you continue to learn. Collegiality, working together, is an academic culture. An academic must be critical. You know, I talked earlier on about we criticizing everything. You must be critical as an academic, but not just criticism for the sake of it. Objective criticism, being critical about subjects, about issues, is part of our culture. An academic must be open. You must disclose everything. There's nothing you are hiding as an academic. Openness is very important. So all of these, we are losing them. If we look at the Nigerian university system today, many universities have lost this simple culture in academia, and we have to do something about it. So I will talk about uh, experiences around the world and what universities and organizations are doing to change the narratives in development, contributing to improving livelihoods, industrialization, aviation, culture, health, and all aspects of life. 
And again, the UN Sustainable Development Issue, these SDGs, has talked about all of these issues. And any university that is not signing into this cannot claim to be a good university. If we have to transform our world, Agenda 2030 is more than enough to guide what we do. The VC talked about the curriculum that NUC is proposing. Some of us have issues about it. You see, we cannot change the world when we are boxed into a corner. I'm sorry, this is my opinion, and I believe that quite a number of our colleagues also have the same opinion. You can change the world. 30% out of 100, then you are given the fair accompli for 70% cast in iron. It cannot work. So it's important that universities strive to free themselves from some of this centralization. I understand Professor Kebukola is the one speaking here on Sunday. I respect him a lot. But there are some of these issues that we need to really consider. So our teaching, our research should change people for the better, should change the planet for the better, should work towards prosperity, should work towards peace, and we have to build partnerships. Again, all of these can be found in the Sustainable Development Goal. And these are issues that can take us close to utopia if we carefully attend to them. So I'll move on to the change we desire, because that's the real issue. In the university system, the first thing is governance. How do we govern the system to ensure that we can influence change in our environment? University governance is not a tea party. It's a very serious business. And it is not an assignment for the lily liver. You see, I granted an interview some time ago, and some people were not happy about it. Again, I don't care. Once I'm convinced on, of my, on my position, I said being a vice chancellor in Nigeria University is not for the nice guy. If you want to be a nice guy, you cannot govern the university system in Nigeria. You see, VCs of private universities are very lucky. Nobody can just walk up to you and start talking rubbish. But you have in the public university system, where somebody who has no business being in the university will confront you about things that are just not normal. Unfortunately, if you don't listen to him or her, can make life impossible for you. And we have seen it happen in many universities. So it's not for the lily liver. It is also not an assignment for the boys. Because if you look at many governing councils in this country, you just wonder what business do they have to do in the university system. Oftentimes, you hear a vice chancellor of a public university describing himself as a political appointee. But people even call them so. Political appointee. A vice chancellor? How? How did you become a political appointee? You don't advertise political appointments, do you? I understand that Ocean State now has a list of commissions. Was it advertised? It was not. Nobody was called to come and discuss it. They have ways of discussing some of these issues. So when a vice chancellor accepts to be described as a political appointee, something must be wrong with that vice chancellor. The position of vice chancellors is always advertised, isn't it? And you pick the best amongst the lot. It goes through stages. It's not offered. So you don't describe yourself or accept to be described as a political appointee. If you do, then you'll be doing something strong and it will affect the governance of the system. In the final analysis, the best should be chosen, whether it's for governing council or for position of principal officer. The best should be chosen. Who will be able to make the changes that we desire? This one country 
where governing council appointment has become so politicized and sadly so, it is distributed amongst those who lobby and possibly failed to achieve some aims politically. Political rejects. Somebody wants to be a minister, he doesn't get it. Wants to be an ambassador, he doesn't get it. The next thing is to push them to the governing council of a university. What do you want such people to achieve? It's the same thing in many state universities. So it is not job for the boys. When you have people who have no business being in the university system, being appointed in such positions, such persons cannot bring the change we desire in the university system. A university governing council is supposed to be populated by the cream de la cream in the society and the academia. Experiences in the Nigerian university institutions have shown that governing councils can either be an asset or a liability. The latter has always been the case in many institutions. The appointment of government, a governing council, board of governors of tertiary institutions should be based purely on merit. People who have a deep understanding of how a good tertiary institution is run should be considered for appointment. Government should appoint people who cannot succumb to the alleles of filthy locker. People of impeccable character who should contribute intellectually and materially to development of the institutions rather than becoming liabilities or parasites. Quite a number of them are parasites. I mean, when you have a chairman of a governing council living on campus, having a secretary, having a fleet of cars, they're like parasites. In other parts of the world, a chairman of a governing council is supposed to add value intellectually and materially to the university system. They bring resources to the university system. So if we want good governance that will contribute to change making, we have to change that approach. Similarly, the position of vice chancellor as primus inter pares in the university system should not be politicized. A vice chancellor should be incorruptible. Mark the word, incorruptible. You see, when a vice chancellor takes a car from a contractor, how do you want that contractor to do a good job? Even if the car costs just five million, but we know vice chancellors who take cars worth 50 million. All my life has been in the university system. I was in the governing council at the University of Ibado. I've had the privilege to head a university. What goes on in the university system is shameful. But you know, we had some of these things under autonomy. I said it earlier on, any project you have in Adelike University that costs five million, in a public university, it can cost 20 million. And it cannot be done without the knowledge of a vice chancellor. The governing council may not even know, because vice chancellors can package these things beautifully. And of course, if you also have a governing council that's also interested, okay, in the deal, you can have a good system. So I expect the vice chancellor to be incorruptible. And I use that word, the total meaning of it. How should the contractor bring me rice? For what? When I was vice chancellor, I told the, the gatekeepers, they call them security guys, at my gate, if anybody brings anything during Christmas or Ilea and you accept it, you're on your own. Because that's the beginning of compromise. What have I done to you or for, for you to deserve being given a bag of rice? There are no fools, contractors are no fools. They charge it into the bill. And for every bag of rice they give you, be rest assured that maybe times 10, the cost of that bag of rice has been included in the contract. A vice chancellor must have the courage to resist all temptations from both internal and external influences that are usually detrimental to achieving the vision and mission of a university. There are always interferences, whether you like it or not. 
I mean, some of us, this guy fought a lot of battles with me. Why should somebody invite me to the House of Assembly and ask me how we employ in the university? Because you have a candidate. You can't push a candidate on me as vice chancellor. And I resisted it. Uh, there was one meeting we held. He was there. And they were telling me, oh, we represent the people of 4.5 million people of Ocean State. Oh, I said, beautiful. But that will not commit me to doing what is wrong. And I used one word which they didn't like. I cannot be bullied to submission. And they said, well, they will invite me to the plenary. I said, I will happily come. But even if I am put in detention, I know I will be released, and I will address a press conference, and I will go back to Ibadan immediately after. My office is waiting for me in Ibadan. So when a vice chancellor succumbs to some of those things, you will be doing things that are wrong. They wanted to know how we award contract. What is their business? Third fund gives us money. I'm accountable to the federal government. But you know, when a vice chancellor is interested in the deal, he will succumb, or he or she, don't let me say, because there are women vice chancellors also. They will succumb to people in the House of Assembly. They will succumb to some of these alleles. They will succumb to some of these evil machinations. So being a vice chancellor is a burden. If you are not strong enough, you don't have strong character, you cannot be a change-making vice chancellor. I've talked so much about corruption, and I think it's important that we try to curtail corruption in the system. Corruption is evil, very, very evil. You know, when I was VC, somebody very high up told me that, you see, you cannot fight corruption in a day. I said, yes, I know. And I asked, are you saying those who were stealing 5,000 naira. I should allow them to be stealing 4,000. Then later, 3,000. Then later, 2,000. Which one is not corruption? So it is evil, and I wonder why anybody, anybody in the university system, because we are supposed to beam the light to the world, will be corrupt. Whatever definition you want to give to it, it is evil and it's not acceptable. There is need for us, if we want to be change makers, to be involved in collaborative and transnational development research. What kind of research are we doing in the university system? Research for promotion. That's what many people are doing. Yes, um, lecturer two, I want to become lecturer one. They need five papers, they need six papers. Then we put it together. What kind of research are we talking about? Research must be collaborative. Research must be meaningful. Research must be transnational. I mean, if you're a professor, I'm sorry, if you're a professor and you are not known outside of your university, hmm, you get a CB. You know, I have, I will always use my own home, my university as an example. There are professors in UI that I'm not proud of. Unfortunately, because we are supposed to be the number one university in Nigeria. There are professors in UI that are not known beyond their faculties, beyond their department. So what kind of professor are you? And you can only be known if you're involved in collaborative research, you are involved in transnational research. Uh, there's so much of this that I have written in the, yes, time up, 15 minutes. I don't need up to that. Okay, so there's so much of that that I have written in this text. We talk of meaningful and enduring partnerships in the university system. We can work alone. Are we working with people of Ede at the Lake University? Are we working with people of Ede? Are we impacting their lives? Are we asking about how we can improve their health, their businesses, their infrastructure? So partnership has so many meanings, and we can do it in several ways. I'm going to mention a few of these. 
we need to use the university system to retrain school teachers. At the Lake University, I don't know if you have program in education, you can be training school teachers during vacation, using university students in primary and secondary school as, as outreach. We need to find a way of improving curriculum. Now we're still talking about A for Apple. Huh? Should it be? There are some children who, have, who don't even know what an apple is. Because apple is exotic. It's strange to us. How can we change that narrative? A for something else that somebody in my village knows. It is our responsibility. We need to introduce hands-on activities and community service. We need to develop graduate education program. We need to strengthen strategy for lifelong uh, learning. I don't know if you have that here, but it's important that we have them. So if we properly implement partnerships, we can all sustain the university's interest. We can sustain the university's reputation. We can also assure the corporate existence of the university in the society. Unfortunately, we tend to work in silos. And I want to hope that those of us who are here will start working together collaboratively to be able to ensure that we make the necessary change. We need to mentor the next generation of change makers. No matter what you do, if you do not mentor, and by mentorship, I'm not talking about supervision. You see, you can supervise a PhD, an MSc, a bachelor's degree without mentoring that person. Mentoring is different from supervision. It is lacking in many of our universities. We need to introduce it. We need to institutionalize it. Mentoring of the next generation of change makers. Many professors relate with their students in a straight-jacketed manner. The relationship in many cases is toxic. That should not be. If we want to make the desired change, we need to mentor people. Access, cost, and quality. I know Adelike University charges fees. It's ridiculous when you say tertiary education should be free. It's ridiculous. It's never free anywhere. And you cannot produce students and candidates that will make the change. You cannot pay salaries. You cannot have infrastructure you desire if you say that university education should be free. It is never done anywhere. You see, where you have a semblance of it, the taxes that people pay, is more than enough to pay for the school fees. If you take Germany, if you take any of those Nordic countries, are you saying that education is free there? It is not free. Those people don't have more than two or three children. And the taxes they pay in a year is more than enough to train 10 children. But here, somebody will have 20 children, and he will want Governor Adeleke to be the one training them, or Mr. Tinubu to be the one training them. It's never done. So we have to think about uh, costs and uh, paying the appropriate. Unfortunately, the university unions have been very funny. I heard about the introduction of the student loan scheme, and I learned that the ASU president said that those who were taking loan were committing suicide. We all take loans. I don't know of anybody in this audience that has not taken loan to train his children or her children. That's what I've done all my life, to train my own children. So we have to be cost conscious about university education. We need to adapt to changes. There are emergencies all over the place. COVID-9 was an emergency we didn't expect. What is going on in the Donbass between Ukraine and Russia? Nobody expected them. There are so many of such emergencies occurring. Universities must adapt to be able to make the necessary changes. We need to embark on intensive research and development. We need to continue training skilled manpower. We have to be training teachers. Many of our schools, primary and secondary schools, they don't have teachers. We need to be able to have institutions that will impact society uh, directly. I'll be rounding off uh, quickly. So my concluding remarks. Human history has shown that utopia is not attainable, but we can strive towards it. 
Human history is also replete with remarkable life-changing inventions in technologies, health, transportation, education, and even in human relations. The transformations that we have witnessed over time have been made possible through game-changing advances, and universities and research centers have been central to all of this. Successful change makers around the world share some common attributes. The first one is we have to be resilient, we must have vision, we must be committed, we must have integrity, and we must be connected. Connected to ourselves, connected to society, connected to our environment. These attributes are in tandem with academic culture and should ordinarily be a way of life in our university systems. Our universities will need to be creative, we need to be innovative, and also become places where significant emphasis on institutional relevance, institutional competitiveness, partnership with productive sectors and communities will be emphasized. We must also accept the reality that we do not know it all. Universities do not know it all. What about the realities of artificial intelligence, chat GPT that I've talked about? These are threatening our continued relevance beyond the certification. There is no information anybody wants that cannot get online now. So we are only training and certifying. People can get the knowledge that we claim to give them elsewhere. So I want to wish the graduates all the very best and to pray that God in his infinite mercies will be with you as you move on in the next phase of your life. We cannot be set in our ways and expect utopia or the semblance of it. The only guarantee for progress is for change makers themselves to change. And I want to challenge private universities to pick up the gauntlet Many of the public universities are in inertia as we are. Private universities have the opportunity to change the narrative as we know them for now. I want to thank all of you for listening. Good morning. Thank you very much, Professor. This way, sir. No, no, this way, sir. Yes, sir. That is Professor Labo de Kukwola, immediate past Vice Chancellor of Oshu State University. <laughs> yes. I believe you can see that this morning you have really educated us. We have been impacted today. Thank you so very much, Professor Labo Kukwola. You may have your seat and everybody. Indeed, it's been a rewarding time this morning talking about striving for utopia. And you know, Prof made mention of a number of things. In striving for utopia, he says that we must be change makers. In other words, we cannot continue to do the same thing the same way and expect to get a different result. In as much as uh, people come here every now and then into Adelike University and they commend the atmosphere and everything that is going on well here. There is always room for improvement, and I believe that we have been challenged this morning to reflect and look at how we can begin to do things differently. And in concluding, he mentioned that one of the attributes of a university that must indeed be a change maker is commitment and connectivity, okay? It is very easy to lose focus. It is very easy, you know, you receive students every year, you graduate students every year. If you're not committed, you know, to the focus 
the goals, the, the, the visions and the mission of the university, uh, you may discover that before too long, you may become irrelevant among the committee of, 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 of universities. But I believe that uh, we have been in, refreshed this morning and we are going home uh, to go and um, do self reevaluation and see how we can re-strategize to continue to be important change maker, an important change maker in the Nigerian university education. At this time, we'll be taking reactions comments and questions from the audience. But before then, I would like to quickly uh, do some recognitions again. I can see at the in the auditorium, somewhere right there at the back, the university boss in person of one I like to call Mazi. Emeka Anemi, sir, you are most welcome. We also have here present the director of AU Consult in person of Dr. Olumuiwa Adeoye, sir, you are welcome. Of course, we have some heads of departments also present. I may not be able to see all of you, but I can see the head of the Department of uh, Computer Science, Dr. Uh, Onomade. Sir, you are welcome. I also see the head, Department of Mass Communications, Dr. Olasende. You are also welcome. We have also here the head, Department of Accounting, Dr. Ebon Adewe. You are welcome. We have the head, Department of Microbiology, Dr. Okola Oladipo. Sir, you're most welcome. We also have the head of the Human Resources, Deputy Registrar, Mrs. Oladayo Aliu. Ma, you are welcome. We have here the Secretary of the College of Postgraduate Studies, Dr. Boju Efutade. You are most welcome. We also have here the head of Hall Services, Dr. Mrs. Mujisola Aino. You are welcome, ma. And I also saw somewhere in the auditorium earlier on the head of the Legal Services Unit, Mrs. Belinda Akiode. You are welcome, ma. We have also from the university, uh, from the Oshun State University, pardon me, um, somebody I believe that has come to uh, celebrate the guest lecturer of today, Dr. J.K. Oluwu Kere. You are welcome, sir. We also have the uh, Dean of School of Public Health, University of Medical Sciences, Ondo, who happens to be a graduand as well in this year's convocation. In person of Professor Adebimpe Olaleko, you are welcome, Prof. Okay. Of course, one of our own also who is also graduating in person of uh, the CEO of the Springtime Development Foundation, Pastor Samuel Oyalabu. You are welcome, sir. I'm also told that the provost of the College of Postgraduate Studies is somewhere in the auditorium, way, way, way at the back. He's in person of Professor James Ebon Atolagbe, sir, you are most welcome. So at this time, we want to take questions and comments from the auditorium. So questions, comments, 
striving for utopia. Okay, I see one hand. Okay, I see another hand. So number one, sir, you can begin to make your way to the uh, front. Number two, sir, I see you. Yes, any more? We should have at least a question from the graduate. Okay, the graduate, are you here? Of course you are here. So let's have a question from you. Perhaps we give you some time to think about your question while we take the first two questions. Good afternoon, sir. Thanks for the wonderful lectures. I pray we take to it in Jesus' name. My question is, if I got you correctly, sir, you are like advocating for freedom uh, instead of being boxed into a corner by the uh, body that is uh, administering the university, you are saying there should be freedom. Sir, I want to ask, if freedom is given to a human being, sometimes we abuse it. How will this freedom, if given, how will it not be abused? <laughs> Good morning, sir. I must say that uh, the Vice Chancellor, sir, the lecture took about how many hours? When you came to say 15 minutes more, I wondered because I was enthralled by the lecture. And as you were delivering your lecture, sir, I remember that on some occasions I had delivered lectures. And when they say question time, you don't have people raising up their hands. I always console myself that they are not raising questions because they understand what I was doing. A round of applause to our father. From the beginning to the end, I was wondering where would I ask my own question? because I understood every bit of what you said. The language was so clear. The expressions were friendly. And I said, but then, towards the end of your lecture, I caught you on one. And that was on this student's loan. <clears throat> I schooled when Nigeria was still good. <laughs> and I know that Nigeria is still good because you said it, that we should be positive. We had loans, student loans. We had students' bustries, uh, students' bustries. We had uh, scholarships, federal states. But that loan thing, it was 500 pounds at that time. But when most of us finished, it was not easy to recoup that loan. And that was a time when we had jobs. Before I left the university, I had three jobs. One in the north, two in the south. Yet, these loans were not recouped. And now from your speech, it looks like you are advocating that these loans should be promoted. How do you think that the country will be able to survive these loans? How would our students, when they finish, in a period when there is no job, two years my son, was out of, was not able to get a job for seven years. And I don't know how government will be able to recoup it. Please give us some enlightenment on how these loans thing will work 
and our students will be able to do it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Prof. I think you are listening. I'm not asking a question, I'm just making a comment. Uh, I must thank you very deeply for the lecture you gave me, in particular as a vice chancellor. I learned a lot from you, that's not that about it. But the fact I want to make is this from what I get you said, it's like the issue of the 30% inclusion of the local content on the CC mass is not to you the best thing. I think it's the right way to do. Years back, years back, luckily I went to the same school. I went to the same school with him. You were talking about Badon. I think I was a senior in Badon. Um, I was in UI in 1972. Uh, you came in year. I don't know, or something. I'm the old one. I left 75, so I'm old. And I knew what it was in those days. When we were just two, I told her I went to Ibadan last week. I went to see my hall, Kuti Hall. How you doing? You know the pros, how you doing? And I saw the Kuti Hall. I went to my room, where I used to be on the ground floor, block L, room 32. And I knew where I was. Then we were just two in a room. At that time, things have changed. And two in a room in those days, each one has a bed, not a bunker. And each one has two bed sheets bed for you and pillowcases by the university. I don't have to bring any bedding in those days. At that time, the good old days, I just pack my clothing and put outside and label Solomon Adebola, Block L, Room 32, Kuti Hall. The porter will come and pack them and wash, iron, and bring them back and lay my bed. I didn't pay a cover for this. At that time, I had two scholarships. I could use only one. Anyway, I wasn't fraudulent. I could use only one. I had Quara scholarship. I had federal scholarship. Federal had no allowance to travel, so I jettisoned it. The Quara had one for tuition, for meal, for travel, for even inconvenience allowance to be a student. I took that. And of course, the scholarship there was massive comparatively. What was the food like in those days? Can't cover for a breakfast with bread and jam and butter and milk and eggs and everything. For lunch, 20 kobo. For dinner, 20 kobo. For the whole day, 50 kobo. Things have changed. That's not really important. The curriculum then was imported from the US of London. When I went there, there were only five universities. Ibadan was the only one in that area. Then OAU came later. That was the University of Ife. Then in Southwest, there were only three. Ibadan, OAU, University of Lagos. The whole vast north had only one university, Modibello University. The whole east had only one, University of Nigeria and Suka. I'm saying then, even in Badon at the beginning, the curriculum was imported and stamped on the way. It couldn't change. Now, what we are saying is this. Let's begin to think of our internal local needs. I told I went to Angus last week. And I saw, I couldn't see if Oke Polai was away. But I saw those who were there, the acting ES, Mayaki Chris, and Dr. Salu. They were very close friends. And I commended the idea of this. And we started here with our prof who was there, the, the chair here, and our DVC, and those who are here, to say, this is the right way to go. We cannot import a single curriculum for the same university in this area, and that area, and that area. The idea is, what are your local needs? So what they are going now and doing is 70% general, then 30% for local need. I think it's the right way to go. But from what I heard you say, I think you are against it. And I see you speaking the mind of ASU. ASU was against it some times ago. I saw ASU, what they were writing, that they are, they are able to go on strike on it again. I said, what nonsense. We're asking for independence for the university. This is the beginning. We may not achieve utopia at the same time, suddenly. But like you said, corruption is little by little. What we are doing now is to achieve the utopia bit by bit. And the beginning is 30% local content for curriculum. If I go to 50 later, maybe 70 and 100 later. But for now, the beginning of 30, I think it's good enough. I respect you, sir. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, sir. 
Thank you very much for the lecture. I have a question. Um, much of the lecture today was centered on um, the academic setting and the academic body. My question is for the graduates that are leaving um, the academic setting. How do we apply the principles learned today and um, the lessons from our institution of learning? How do we become change makers outside this institution? Thank you. Okay, so this will probably be the last question and comment we'll be taking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof, for the wonderful lecture. All over the years, I've been having an issue. And the issue is that when people come to present paper, or when you go for workshops or conferences, a lot of recommendations are normally made. When those recommendations are made, they are not targeted at anybody. There is no person given the responsibility for implementation. I'm not so uh, optimistic about this uh, topic because the aspect I expect towards the end of your paper, sir, is that you have given us all the good things, but how do you go about it? And there's an adage that says, if you cannot beat them, what do you say? Join them. Because you cannot be a lone tree in the forest wanting a change if there's no collaboration about the change. Here in Adeleke, if you say you want to implement this, and you can see our colleagues are not doing it, some of you come to say, are you the only one? Don't worry yourself, things like that. I was looking forward to a situation whereby recommendations can come about other forming, like in this school now, association of change makers. And you'll be given your terms of reference so that uh, we know what we are doing. But the way you have said this, uh, good. By the time you go away, and that's the end of the whole thing. And that has been the problem in this country. Most of the time people come and present power, not, nobody's given the challenge to go and implement. I want to see our actual view about how can we implement some of these things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Before we take the response or responses from the guest lecturer, uh, permit me to quickly recognize again the uh, from the Department of Nursing, Oshun State University, Dr. Mrs. Adeniro. You are welcome. We also have the head, Department of Business Admin, present here, Dr. Abel Akitaro. You are welcome, sir. So, we will be taking responses from the guest lecturer, but I would like to add uh, my, my question as well. Uh, my question is somewhat in between what my vice chancellor has said and what the guest lecturer has said. I agree with my vice chancellor that clearly we need to do things differently. And universities, you know, should be given uh, the free hand, we also mentioned, you know, to, to, to contribute, okay, to their uniqueness and to their offerings to the society. But personally, you know, just as he expressed his personal opinion, I, I, I think the way it is being uh, executed is a little faulty. The time we were given to come up with the curriculum were very, very short and limited. And I doubt if truly our identity is reflected in what we have come up with. Because all we were concerned about was to meet the deadline and just to turn in something. So I really don't know if what we have turned in is a reflection of what we had in the past or truly a reflection of our identity. I also learned that already, uh, holes are being picked into the 70%. In other words, it's not, there are problems with this. We are striving for utopia, but we are trying to enforce something that is already problematic. And it appears that the um, coordinators of this program do not want to even touch that 70% at all for now. So the question uh, to the, my guest lecturer 
is that where do we go from here? Because it appears NUC is focused on ensuring that we, we, we go ahead with CCMAS and some uh, segments of the academia are raising concerns about that system. How do we go forward as, an, as, as, a, as a country so that we can really attain um, the utopia that we desire? Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much for all the questions. The professor that spoke a couple of minutes back said when you deliver a lecture and there is no question, it means uh, either everybody understood what you said or they didn't even understand it. But there are questions. It means people were listening. Uh, the first one is about freedom and abuse of freedom. My simple response to this is that there is nothing called absolute freedom. And every freedom comes with privilege and responsibilities. So I don't see where abuse should come in. And when abuse comes in, I think there are always sanctions. So I don't think it's something we have to worry about. People will always want to abuse freedom. There's no doubt about that. But that's why we also have sanctions. I guess the problem we have is that most of these sanctions are not applied. So I hope that has answered your question. The issue of student loan, bursary, scholarship, not easy to recoup. How many of us take loan from our cooperative or the banks and we don't pay back? Do we take loans from cooperatives or from the bank and we don't pay back? Every dime that I used to train my children was from the bank, and I had to pay back. You see, the problem is we see these resources as Tiwa. It's government-owned, so what will government do to me? I saw a document dating back to the 70s, those who were against the student loan scheme, about defaulters. This simple feeling that if it is government's own, we treat it anyhow. That is the problem, sir. I think it's important that we institute the student loan in a way that we can recoup for government. That's one part of it. The second part of it, which is also bitter, and I don't like to tell things that will make me popular, tertiary education is not compulsory. Tertiary university education is not compulsory. What is compulsory is primary and secondary. So we have this feeling that everybody must go to a university. It doesn't have to be. The richest people in Nigeria, how many of them went to university? Even in our communities, the essence of university education, we all know, and I'm happy, sir, that you come from the north. I think you are Kogisa. Yeah, you are from the north. I also have some attachment to the North. And I know that the North was very, very deliberate in those they trained in those days. They knew those who would go to the army, and they channeled their training towards that. They knew those who would go into the civil service, and they channeled their training towards that. They knew those who would go into the diplomatic sector. That's what we should do. And it has to be in a way that people will know that you've been trained for a purpose, not just anybody and everybody being in the university. If you go to any university in the UK today, most of those you find there are not English people. They are Asians and Africans. So university education is not compulsory, sir. So I hope that resolves the issue of uh, the loans thing, and I think even if when you take a loan, discipline, commitment should be it. Why should somebody take a loan and will not pay back? It's something we should talk about. It's something we should preach against. When something belongs to government, nobody seems to care. And I want to hope that if government means business, instituting this loan scheme, they will do it in a way where nobody will escape. I also want to feel that there probably will be more jobs. 
Because what government is spending to train people now, which we don't appreciate, is enormous. The wage bill of UI is over a billion naira per month. Yet, as we will say, that government is not funding education. If people are paying some amount, all of that will not come from the federal government. There will be jobs. UI itself will be able to recruit people it needs. So I want to believe that with commitment, with discipline, there probably will be more jobs when we institute the loan scheme. You talked about the good old days. Hmm. Well, I didn't have all the time. I always talk to those of us who are probably on the other side age-wise to be very careful when you talk about the good old days. I'm not very sure those days were actually good. I schooled in Ibado, secondary school, and I was in the boarding house. And when I traveled from Inisha, I met this young girl as a secondary school student. We started as secondary school students. <laughs> yeah, she was in St. Teresa's College then, so don't ask me how it happened. She toasted me anyway. <laughs> So those good old days you're talking about, you probably will leave Kaba or where? Huh? And your parents won't even know whether you've got to Ibadan or not until they receive the letter from you, maybe two months after. But these bad days, huh? your son is leaving a day, going to Ushubo. You can even call three times. Are you, in, are you already in Ushubo? Are you telling me that those days are better no, I don't think so. You see, there were things, there wasn't what? Oh, the word insecurity, VC, don't let us go into that. The word insecurity is a new word, isn't it? Kidnapping is a new word. Huh? These are words that have existed. You see, when it's part of the changes we are talking about, when you were you, how many were you? In your days in you are how many of you? No, 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 you are the one that raised the issue. How many were you? Probably less than 4,000, the total population. Probably much less. About 1,000, and you want to say that population is not a factor. So please, it's dynamic. Yesterday was good, today is also good, I'm insisting. Because I tell people that many of my age mates that didn't make it in life just because of malaria, ordinary malaria, I can't count the number of people who died. My age group, and I'm sure it's the same with you. Simple diseases, diseases that could be prevented, diseases that could be cured easily. We are not happy having that any longer. So those things you talked about, they will iron your clothes, they will give you food. How many people were able to afford the 10 Naira you talked about then? I was in Zik Hall. Not everybody could, the best hall, you won't want to hear that, the best hall. You see, how many, how many people were able to eat in the cafeteria? We still had people who were cooking, the poor ones were the ones cooking in the hostels then. We still had people who were cooking, but who couldn't afford the tickets. Yes, I could buy a packet of tickets at less than 20 Naira. I was always sitting in the cafeteria because I, I had that little privilege. But we also had many people who couldn't afford it. So, sir, I want to plead, let's encourage these young ones by letting them know that, yes, those days were good, today is also good. Um, I am not an ASU member. I resigned my membership of ASU in 2015 when I discovered that they were derailing. So my position about the curriculum is not a support for us. It's just what I feel. There has to be flexibility. Why 30% across board? There are, there are over 200 universities in Nigeria, different ages, different generations, different focus. It should be flexible. I'm not against that. And I'm going to share an experience with you. See, we are very conservative, all of us. When I started the Center for Sustainable Development, some professors protested because I said, if you're coming in to do a graduate study, 
in sustainable development. You can come from any discipline. You can come from religious studies, you can come from technology, you can come from the health sciences. Come and contribute to development. Some professors were against it. Now it has come to stay. That Center for Sustainable Development is probably the first in the whole world. Columbia University, New York copied it from us in Nigeria. The point I am making is that there should be some flexibility. NUC will tell you that, oh, you cannot award a degree as a center. Where is it written? Where is it written that a center cannot award a degree? It doesn't happen in other parts of the world. So it's like boxing everybody into one corner. I'm only talking about the need for some flexibility. It's not that I'm against the 30% per se. And finally, I'm not a member of ASU. When they started the railing, I resigned my membership. Somebody talked about the graduates. I wish I had all the time. For lectures like this, I devote at least two pages to the graduates because you are the reasons why we're here. Okay, um, my admonition to you, don't japa. <laughs> don't japa because you see, the future is, you don't want to hear it, but see when you get there, you will know the future is here. And you are the ones that will make that future happen. You can become anything you want to become here. Please, don't jackpa. Uh, Professor Neo Shundari is giving a lecture somewhere today. You know him, the literary giant. Okay, he moved from UI to New Orleans. Uh, we're very close. The lecture is jackpa and Janu. You see, you can jackpa and channel. In other words, you jackpa and you realize that you're lost. There are so many people who have jackpa that I know that are suffering and they are complaining. So please endure, but please, there's nothing stopping you from seeking more education outside the shores of Nigeria. All my children did that, but they must have their first degree in Nigeria. That's the rule. That's a policy in my home. You must have your first degree in Nigeria, but you can go anywhere. Some of them would go, they're lucky, they get jobs, they stay on. Some of them will come back. I have one who told me from day one that he was not going to stay in the UK, that he would just finish and come back. And let me add this, and it's good for you to know, you need to learn a trade. Uh, I'm a professor, their mommy is a professor, all of them learned a trade after secondary school. We have fashion designers among them. We have caterers among them. Learn a trade. Don't just wait for the white collar job because it may not come all over the world. Employment into government services are, are declining. In fact, those who work in the civil service in a state like Lagos are probably more than those who work in civil service in the whole of England. So don't look up to white collar job. Learn a trade in addition to the degree you are acquiring. And if you have to go out, please do, but don't go in protest. You see, the mistake you guys are making is that, oh, this is not a good place because of what the VC was saying that in the good old days. I mean, I don't believe there was any good old days. Okay, today is also good. Travel abroad, seek higher education, but please don't do that in protest. Don't do that as if this place is hell. Do it as if you want to add value to yourself and you want to come back to Nigeria to be a change maker. That's my ad admonition to you. Somebody talked about recommendations. I hope you will have a copy of that document. The recommendations are there. And I even mentioned quite a number of them. You see, you cannot walk in silos and expect to be a change maker. I talked extensively about that. Let's have collaborative research. Let's have transnational research. I talked about corruption, the fight against corruption. All of us should fight against it. Unfortunately, we have different names for it. 
Some people call it grace of God. You see, I thought those are recommendations. Search your conscience. Are you the type of person who will receive something that does not? I swear to people and I boast about it, I have never taken or received or given a bribe in my life. I have never. In any form. If you want to punish me, punish me. Some people will tell you that, oh, you want a visa and you have to settle some people. I will not. It's not compulsory that I must have that visa. And when it is time for them to invite me, they will invite me. Okay, so those are recommendations, sir. Uh, we don't have to really set up any committee or any group that will enforce them. We all know these things. What is right is right. What is wrong is wrong. Um, this guy who said he agreed with his VC, do you have a choice? <laughs> you don't have a choice. You have to agree with your VC. But my position is very clear. My position is very clear. What I'm saying is that it should be flexible. We cannot box everybody into one corner. Can you see his position and ag agitation against... Uh, I think I've answered that. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Labo Kukwola, for this wonderful lecture today. You will agree with me that it has been a rewarding time. Is there anyone here that we've wasted your two hours thereabouts this morning? No, that person is not here. Okay. So once again, Prof, we are grateful for this wonderful privilege you have given to us. Um, before we move on, I would like to recognize yet again one of our graduates who is also the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church Ocean Conference, Pastor Joseph Adebomi. Pastor, you are welcome. And of course, uh, the head of the medical center, I can also cite somewhere there at the back, Dr. Lilian Njoku, you are welcome, ma. We're gradually coasting to the end of today's event. At this time, I would like to invite to the stage for the closing remarks, the Senior Vice President and the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Adelike University, Professor Luke Onoha. A round of applause as Prof comes forward. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, fellow principal officers here, the deans, HODs, and the students who we have gathered here to mark the end of their stay in the university. The guest speaker, I'm really glad to meet you. I am not going to talk much about what you have said. And by the way, by the time allocated for this presentation, I think I should have started coming back before I got here. So you can expect very brief comment from me. The presentation of the day is one that is very, very valuable. Uh, when somebody was saying we needed a committee to begin to record how to move forward, I was thinking differently, just like the presenter did think. Because what I saw here today is a presentation that called for responsible engagement from all stakeholders in the university system. And those stakeholders were well mentioned in the course of our presentation. And uh, the presentation did mention particular areas where many universities are making impact. It talked about on the people, it talked about on the planet. It talked about 
prosperity. It talked about peace and it talked about partnership. When you consider all that we have been addressed with today, you will agree with me that anyone who is engaged in the university system and is able to pick any of those areas and make particular contribution, that person will definitely be noted. And above all, the lecture that we listened to talked about the change we desire. That is wonderful. That we need to look at the whole system, beginning from the governance. By the way, we are talking about the utopia. And they are listening to a lecture that told me, even though utopia is not something you think you can get, but you must strive for. In other words, the, the word utopia is a, becomes an inspiration. An inspiration that, look, there's something bigger out there, even though I may not be the one to bring it up in one day. I can do something to change the narrative. And it talks about governance. The governance of the university should be one that is based on merit and quality rather than talking about uh, political appointments and the rest of them. They talked about issues of corruption. Of course, you, everyone who knows the story of Nigeria, and I think everyone here knows it, we have come to the kind of position where it seems nothing works the way we want it to work. But today's lecture leaves us a positive note that even though it might not be as we want it to be, you and I are the change makers that will make possible for that to come. Mentoring our students, mentoring the change makers, I think that also is one of the things I noted strongly and we continue to talk about it in our Delicate University, that we are not just here to teach, collect salaries, and walk away. We want to be able to create or replicate ourselves. In fact, from the, today's presentation, I, I think that the statement that we replicate ourselves is not even a very good one. We should try to produce people that will be better than ourselves rather than replicating ourselves. And I got it from the presentation of today as well. And I share with you, and very soon I will also make it even louder than that, that anybody that is talking about free education is not resonating with the realities. We must pay for what we consume. Nobody gets nothing free, even when nature has some deposits that we can draw from. We must make effort to get at those. If we don't make the effort to get at them, we must reward those who have made the effort to bring those things from where nature deposited them. So then the other is adjusting and adapting. I find that very, very important. If we must, uh, you know, I don't know who I was discussing that with this morning. The question of, uh, that's not how we do it. That's not how we do it. You come into a system, you come with bright ideas. Then you meet with people who say, no, we have done it X, Y, Z ways in the past. And they want to stay there. The kind of university that will make the right impact to the individuals and to society must be the one that you find people who are ready to take situations from where they made it and drive it to a better end. So I want to thank you, sir, for your coming here today. And I want to ask that all of us should go home and